Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Early Asimov Volume 1 by Isaac Asimov. So this is a collection of Isaac Asimov's sort of earliest published work. Uh, each short story also comes with an introductory essay where he kind of gives the, the history of it, talks about where he got the ideas from, um, the publishing history of it, all that kind of good stuff. So as always, I'm going to start by reading out the blurb to you guys, and then we're going to dive on in, and I am going to uh, check through some of my tabs and then share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. Asimov's first orbits. In the late 1930s, a new young talent began to make his mark on the science fiction scene with a succession of outstanding stories in the various SF magazines of the time. His name? Isaac Asimov. He was later to become world renowned as the author of such classics of modern science fiction as the Epic Foundation trilogy and the Robot stories in which he formulated the now famous Three Laws of Robotics. The early Asimov, published in three volumes in Panther Science Fiction, is an unsurpassed showcase of the storytelling brilliance of the young Asimov. Each story is prefaced by Dr. Asimov with the fascinating biographical details of how and when he came to write it, as well as his own critical evaluation of it. The result is a doubly rich science fiction treat, a collection of tales that makes engrossing entertainment in its own right and, in addition, gives the reader a first-hand look at the development of the 20th century's undisputed grand master of science fiction. Wow, what a blurb. So Asimov is kind of known for being very prolific and we learn a bit about that here. He says, um, although I have written over 120 books on almost every subject from astronomy to Shakespeare and from mathematics to satire, it is probably as a science fiction writer that I am best known. Uh, he's actually, I think he holds the, Dewey, the record for the most uh, different Dewey Decimal overall categories. I think he has nine of the 10 categories uh, he has a book published under. Uh, and he also talks about a journal he keeps and I, and I thought it was interesting because it's uh, quite similar to my own habits towards keeping a journal but also Asimov is an INTJ um, which is a Myers-Briggs personality type and I share the same personality type so it's kind of unsurprising that we have things in common. So he says, um, fortunately I have a diary which I have been keeping since January the 1st 1938, the day before my 18th birthday. It can give me the dates and details. And a uh, footnote, he says, The diary began as the sort of thing a teenager would write, but it quickly degenerated to a simple kind of literary record. It is, to, it is, to anyone but myself, utterly boring. So boring, in fact, that I leave it around for anyone who wishes to read. No one ever reads more than two pages. Occasionally someone asks me if I have never felt that my diary ought to record my innermost feelings and emotions, and my answer is always, no, never. After all, what's the point of being a writer if I have to waste my innermost feelings and emotions on a mere diary? And, um... He writes here, I think this is interesting because he has been criticised uh, by modern readers for not having enough women in his stories. And uh, he kind of writes about that here, he says, You will notice that there are no girls in the story. This is not really surprising. At 18 I was busy finishing college and working in my father's candy store and handling a paper delivery route morning and evening. And I had actually never had time to have a date. I didn't know anything at all about girls, except for such biology as I got out of books and from other, more knowledgeable boys. I eventually had dates, and I eventually introduced girls into my stories, but the early imprinting had its effect. To this very day, the romantic element in my stories is minor, and the sexual element virtually nil. But that's good, because I don't really like romance. So he says, uh, the, his cheque for $64, one cent a word, on October the 31st, was the first money he ever earned as a professional writer. So we have a story about a couple of people who are stuck in space and um, they have kind of a rivalry going on and they almost freeze to death basically. So we get a uh, frozen solid, he said bleakly, and wrapped another sheet about himself. It was hard to think of anything but the increase in cold now. Roy and Jimmy had requisitioned every sheet and blanket on the ship after having put on three or four shirts and a like number of pairs of pants. They kept in bed for as long as they were able and when forced to move out, they huddled near the small oil burner for warmth. Even this doubtful pleasure was soon denied them, for, as Jimmy remarked, the oil supply is extremely limited and we will need the burner to thaw out the water and food. Tempers were short and clashes frequent, but the common misery kept them from actually jumping on each other's throats. It was on the tenth day, however, that the two, united by a common hatred, suddenly became friends, and that's because they discover something uh, about the reason they're in this situation in the first place. So here we have trends. This story basically tells the story of, like, uh, a negative public reaction to a planned space launch um, and kind of reflects a lot of the fake news and fear mongering that we have going on today in our society. So continuing with Asimov, uh, there's a spaceship called Prom the Prometheus and then they build the new Prometheus which just puts me in mind of Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. So I want to read this out which is part of the essay about this story. Trends is an amusing story in some respects. It sets the initial space flights to the moon in the 1970s. 
I thought at the time I was being daring indeed, but it has turned out that I was behind the eventual reality by a full decade, since what I described was done, and with immensely greater sophistication, in the 1960s. My description of the first attempts at spaceflight was, of course, incredibly naive in hindsight. In one respect, however, the story is unusual. In recent years, Phil Klass, a science fiction writer who publishes under the pseudonym William Ten, pointed out to me that this was the first story in history that predicted resistance of any kind to the notion of space exploration. In all other stories, the general public was either indifferent or enthusiastic. This makes me sound enormously and uniquely perceptive, but having explained the nature of the book I was doing my MYA work on, I can't take credit for brilliance. Notice also the reference to the Second World War of 1940. The story, remember, was written two months after Munich. I did not believe at the time that this meant peace in our time, as Neville Chamberlain had maintained. I estimated that there would be a war in a year and a half, and again I was too conservative. And uh, here Asimov talks about his name and how it's kind of helped him uh, as a writer. Which is funny because I talk about this sometimes in terms of how like uh, Dane Cobain, my name there, has helped me as a writer. As it happened, my disinclination for a pseudonym was lucky indeed, for the name Isaac Asimov proved highly visible. No one could see the name for the first time without smiling at its oddness, and anyone seeing it the second time would instantly re remember the first time. I'm convinced that at least part of my eventual popularity came about because the readers recognised the name quickly and became aware of my stories as a group. Indeed, matters came full circle. In later years, I frequently met readers who were convinced the name was a pseudonym designed to achieve visibility and that my real name must be something like John Smith. It was sometimes hard to disabuse them. Somebody says, hate is never hard to drum up. Emotionalism, propaganda, frank and unscrupulous opportunism. And I just think that's very reminiscent of the, uh, the times we live in today, you know? So uh, here in another one of his essays, he says, uh, It is my habit now to begin by typing a first draft without an outline. I compose freely on the typewriter, though I'm frequently questioned about this by readers who seem to think an initial draft can be only in pencil. Actually, writing by hand begins to hurt my wrist after 15 minutes or so. It's very slow and it's hard to read. I can type, on the other hand, 90 words a minute and keep that up for hours without difficulty. As for outlines, I tried one once and it was disastrous, like trying to play the piano from inside a straitjacket. Having completed the first draft, I go over it and correct it in pen and ink. I then retype the whole thing as the final copy. I revise no more of my own volition. If an editor asks for a clearly defined revision of a minor nature with the philosophy of which I agree, I oblige. A request for a major top to bottom revision or a second revision after the first is another matter altogether. Then I do refuse. This is not out of arrogance or temperament. It is just that too large a revision or too many revisions indicate that the piece of writing is a failure. In the time it would take to salvage such a failure, I could write a new piece altogether and have infinitely more fun in the process. Doing a revision is something like chewing used gum. Failures are therefore put to one side and held for possible sale elsewhere. For what is a failure to one editor is not necessarily a failure to another. So yeah, that's about all I have to say about the early Asimov volume one by Isaac Asimov. Uh, I think as you can tell, I, the bits that I found the most interesting were actually his introductory essays. The stories were okay, but they are again his early stories and so they're also not his best. Uh, they do show some of his, his early promise though. Uh, and there are some pretty interesting ideas in there that he talks about. So overall, I'd give it like a 3.5 out of 5. And I would recommend it if you're an Asimov fan. But if, you, if you're new to Asimov, probably not the best place to start. So there we have it. That's what I made of the early Asimov Volume 1 by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book. And if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit the subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.